For a time, Mega Man X games were sort of yearly releases. Mega Man X in 1993, X2 in 1994, X3 in 1995, the only sort of exception was Mega Man X4, which came out in the summer of 1997, about a year and a half following Mega Man X3. Still, they were all released relatively close to each other, but then comes along Mega Man X5, which didn't get released until late 2000 in Japan, early 2001 in America, and summer of 2001 for Europe, the biggest time gap between Mega Man X releases thus far. Not that I can discern a reason, but I found that interesting. Was it a result of Mega Man's waning popularity at the time? Was all the attention on the Mega Man Legends series? Classic Mega Man was already in hibernation at this point, and it wouldn't be until 2008 until he saw some action again, so was the same holding true for Mega Man X? But whatever it may be, Mega Man X5 was originally meant to be the future Blue Bomber's swan song, as Keiji Inafune really wanted to focus on Zero and make a sub-series just for him on the Game Boy Advance. Hey, at least he was being open and honest about it finally, it would explain why X's significance was slowly dwindling as the game series went on. And next time I head into Mega Man, it'll be with the Zero series for sure, but for Mega Man X, they wanted to end things with a bang. The end all, be all of the Mega Man X storyline from what's been established. And seeing how there's still three games after this one, I think we all knew how that turned out, but whatever. No point in lingering on that little factoid. Let's see how things were originally meant to end, to see how things were going to conclude between X, Zero, and the returning Sigma. Yeah, I say the returning Sigma because right off the bat, as before, X5 makes it clear who the real villain is behind the scenes, despite trying to focus on someone else. In the shadows lies a mysterious reploid named Dynamo that's been tasked by Sigma to send the space colony Eurasia on a collision course towards Earth. Soon afterwards, Sigma himself appears to attack the Maverick Hunters directly, prompting X and Zero to jump right in and take him on, ending with the two heroes winning rather easily. But it turns out this is what Sigma wanted all along, for as soon as he explodes, he releases a Sigma virus that envelops the entire goddamn planet. Worldwide, reploids and humans are slowly being corrupted by this new strand of the Sigma virus, throwing everything into chaos, and on top of that, the Eurasia space colony is now heading to collide into the planet in about 16 hours. We're talking about a code level Omega extinction event going on here where nobody makes it out good in this scenario, and the pressure's on for X and Zero to come up with a plan to stop Sigma once and for all once again. But despite that predicament, I mean, you're still going through eight stages and killing a bunch of rogue robots, so as far as structure goes, nothing's really that different. But here's the goal. To prevent the space colony from hitting Earth, X and Zero head to different parts of the planet to collect the necessary components to refurbish the Enigma, an oddly appropriate name for a wave motion gun because it's a goddamn mystery on how this thing is supposed to work right. With the Enigma, the team plan on obliterating the colony before it even has a chance to reach impact, so our two heroes head off to get the parts they need with support from their new crew, Alia acting as mission control that's a little too chatty when it comes to helping out, Sigma which I always thought sounded so remarkably close to Sigma that I thought he was secretly Sigma in disguise or some other shit. And finally, Douglas, the, I'm sorry, Doglass, going by the opening FMV. Douglas is essentially the series auto. They got a similar color scheme for starters and they specialize in augmenting your armor with special perks, which I'll cover later on. Apart from the other games, you're encouraged to face off against four specific Mavericks from the start. Although you're free to choose from any of the eight available, only a select few carry the parts needed for the Enigma cannon. Starting off, we have Grizzly Sla- wait. Crescent Grizzly? Oh no, they did. Oh God, they did. They changed the names back to normal. It's not supposed to be Tidal Whale, it's Duff McWhalen. Come on, that's one of the most badass names for a Maverick yet. I I'm sorry, I can't play this on the Legacy Collection. I'm going back to the PS1. I'm sure you heard this story a million times, particularly if you're an X fan already, but for the few that didn't know, all the Mavericks in X5 were named after members from Guns N' Roses. Grizzly Slash, the Skyver, Axel the Red, just to name a few. Allison Cord, who you may know as Claire Redfield from Resident Evil 2 and Beyond, was in fact the English translator for Mega Man X5 and her then husband at the time was a big fan of Guns N' Roses, so he requested that Miss Court change the names into what you see here. Duff McWhalen, gosh, so bad that I love it. It's a reference loss to those who don't know what a gun and or rose is, but I always thought it was funny. All right, back on the PlayStation 1, much better. I think I'll stay with the PS1 version for the rest of the video, and you know what, I'll do the same for X6 for the sake of consistency. I know the Legacy Collection is out at this point, and it is fantastic to have all these available for current consoles, but I had some initial quirks. I downloaded the bundle for the Switch at first, and I ran into some pretty bad lag at some parts and audio stuttering when I was playing the PS1 games. I asked on Twitter if anyone else had this issue, and it's been confirmed that the Switch and PC version are a little rough around the edges. Not a deal breaker, but they're not perfectly optimized, so I went and got it for the PS4, and so far so good. There's next to no load times for the PS1 games, like in the original X collection, that's great. And I love the oodles of additional galleries for every game in the series. I'm gonna save my complete thoughts for the Legacy Collection in a future video, but I did wanna highlight a couple of things. That's it. Another reason why I'm sticking to the PlayStation for X5 and X6 is my lack of enthusiasm for Legacy Collection's graphic filters. In my opinion, you should never, ever make the pixels melt together to give it a pseudo HD look. I, I just think it never looks good, but the lack of any filter makes the game look too scratchy and raw in HD quality. The CRT filter is the best in my opinion, if I had to pick one. But strangely, I don't think any of them compare 
there to playing the game on the PS3 or maybe getting physical copies for the PlayStation 1 and playing them on a CRT. You know, this is really nitpicky shit on my behalf. I'm totally aware of that. But if I have a preference, I have a preference and I can't change that even for the sake of convenience. Anyway, where the hell was I? Oh, right, 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 the Enigma cannon. So again, you're encouraged to go after four specific Mavericks to get the parts for the cannon. I'm actually surprised they didn't go the Mega Man 8 method and straight up limit the amount of stages you can access at once. But I guess you can kind of play the game like that anyway, now that I think about it. You can choose between X and Zero when you begin like an X4, but this time you can swap between the two before and after every stage, which is great for giving players approach options. Do you feel more comfortable taking out enemies from a distance in Squid Adler stage? Then you pick X. Do you think it's better to get up in opponent's faces, or maybe you feel a sword is better than a gun for this scenario? Then you pick Zero. Keep in mind though, because of this setup, you now have to consider which character gets heart tanks for permanent health boost, since there's still only eight to go around. This doesn't hold true for sub tanks, thankfully. Those are shared between X and Zero, and no matter who you defeat a Maverick with, you get the special weapon for both characters. Depending on who you choose in the beginning, you can also unlock a special perk for that character for the rest of the game. Just gonna say this now, you pick X as your starting character. As a bonus, you get his fourth armor. Yeah, the entire set from Mega Man X4. You got the added defense, the humongous plasma charge shot, and though you don't have unlimited ammo for special weapons anymore, ammo consumption is still reduced by 50%, giving you more to work with. It's not perfect, but better than your default armor, and again, you have all this from the start. It's great. If you choose Zero as your starting character, X loses his fourth armor permanently, and you're left with Zero Z Buster, which sucks. It has a longer than normal startup time, you can't charge it, and its firing rate is inadequate. It gives Zero a long range option, but if you want long range options, then you just stick with X. I suppose it's good for those enemies with those pesky shields. Zero has it pretty bad with a select number of enemies in this game. In fact, unlike X4, I actually prefer to play this game as X. I think he's just better suited to do with what X5 throws at you this time, not just because of the armor upgrades, but the level design feels more in line with his abilities. Don't get me wrong, the game's perfectly playable with Zero, and against bosses, he's just as fun as before. But level progression can certainly feel more awkward. Squid Adler, for instance, is a pain in the ass with the red guy, not just because the stage sucker punches you in the beginning. Ready? Nope, I sure wasn't. But the second half of the level is filled with these stationary robots that you can only hit when their guard is down, which I find clumsy to do with zero and I'd rather just ignore them. And then there's these locked doors that require you to hit these mechanisms repeatedly until they lock in place. But you can't dawdle for too long otherwise the locks reset, so with zero I not only have to get close but I also gotta scatter back and forth to unlock both doors at the same time. It's not horrible, but awkward as hell. This game does say that zero is meant for advanced players, but I feel this design wasn't properly balanced to consider both, unlike X4, a game where I had no problem playing a zero at all. But some stages just suck no matter who you pick. I love Duff McWhalen's name, I really do, but his level is a fucking drag. An incredibly slow auto-scroller with three mini bosses that, assuming you're going through the intended route, you have to visit three times if you want to get all the upgrades, since one of X's armor upgrades requires that you have Duff McWhalen's weapon. At least the weapon's nifty. In fact, I do like X5's selection of weapons compared to X4. The charged up crescent shot is a fantastic shield that eats up enemies like popcorn. Squid Adler's weapon is a great callback to classic Mega Man's Thunder Beam. That's awesome for shredding through big robots, especially. And the dark hold from Dark Dizzy that can freeze time is goddamn essential for getting past these instant kill lasers near the end of the game. It's not so much that the other weapons are bad, they're good for taking care of bosses as is usually the case, but most of them are completely overshadowed by one of the best armor sets in the history of the franchise, the Falcon Armor. Before that though, Mega Man X5 decides to handle armor upgrades in a dumb as hell fashion. Because of the virus currently infesting the planet, Dr. Light now feels it's unsafe to install the upgrades one at a time like before. Therefore, X can now only use the armor when the entire set is complete, which is lame. It completely it removes the sense of satisfaction you feel when you find these things. I mean, it's still sort of there, but now you can't use any of the upgrades until you find the others. Having access to the fourth armor from the start somewhat mitigates this, but why fix what wasn't broken, you know? Well, backwards design and all, you want to go after the new Falcon armor. There's also now a second set of armor parts that X can acquire. Yeah, X5 has a total of three armor sets for X in this game. Four if you include the returning ultimate armor that you can get by either inputting a code or by waiting near the end of the game, like how you got the Shoryuken or the Golden Armor in X3. The Gaia armor gives you added defense and makes you immune to spikes, but your range is pathetic, you move at half the speed, and you can't use special weapons at all. I only use this armor for heart tanks I couldn't reach otherwise and to help against Rangdabanga. Yeah, it's his name, Rangdabanga. That's it. It's, it might as well be the right armors in X3. Three. This armor blows, it's too specific on its capabilities and it isn't versatile. It's nothing compared to the Falcon armor. Now this set has one feature and one feature alone that breaks the game in half. It lets you fly for a few seconds and makes you completely invincible while doing so. You know, as long as you don't run into spikes or some other instant kill scenario. This makes the second half of the game completely trivial with X. I don't have to fight anything unless it's a mini boss or the end stage Maverick. And yeah, you can't charge special weapons while using the armor, but seeing as it's easy enough to kill things with uncharged shots, this isn't really a downside. 
This does somewhat undermine the other weapons, I realize, and it puts even less emphasis on the new part system. So I wasn't sure how this worked initially, but I think I got the gist of it. Bosses now have a level of strength, which you can see right here under their health bar. The higher the level, the more health they have, and damn, they can get pretty long. When you defeat a boss, you not only get their special weapon, but you can also get a part that you can augment to your armor, something like faster movement speed, higher jumps, a more powerful dash, some pretty handy shit. But you're limited to the amount you can equip at once. X and Zero by default can equip four parts, but the armor sets can only equip two, while the Gaia armor can't equip any piece of shit. The only way you can score specific parts is by defeating these Mavericks at a high enough level. I think level eight is the bare minimum, and a boss's level is determined by a number of factors. The amount of Mavericks you already defeated, your Hunter rank, which I think increases the better you do in the stage, I'm not sure on that, and finally the amount of time you have left before the space colony collides with the planet. If you want to score as many parts as possible, you gotta go a real roundabout way of playing this game. Since you need bosses at a high enough level but can't increase your rank by completing stages or by defeating other robots, this means you gotta waste hours on the clock since it's your only option left. So how do you do this? Dying a lot, you get a game over. You head back to the stage selection screen, pick the stage again, and drain the clock since it goes down by an hour every time you pick a stage. Once you finally reach the threshold needed, you can score the part you need from the beaten boss, but you also gotta choose the right option because the part you're given is determined by whether you choose weapon and life or weapon and energy. The former giving you the weapon and extra health, while the latter gives you the weapon and additional ammo for it. I don't, did you catch any of that? I feel this could have been better handled. If you play the game normally, you're gonna get some parts regardless, maybe a little random, but who knows, you might score something that can give you an extra edge in combat. But for a new game, mechanic, this sure was clumsily implemented, but honestly, the extra parts are fine, sure. But if you're using anything other than normal X, I don't think you need them at all. You have a time limit for collecting the parts for the cannon, 16 hours to be exact, which goes down by an hour every time you enter a stage from the menu. If you're playing the game like any other X game, this is more than enough time. And it's not as if the game immediately ends if you run out of time, you just shoot the cannon with what you have. The main purpose of collecting the parts is to improve the chances of the cannon succeeding. From the start, it has a success rate of a paltry 32%, but by defeating the four Mavericks and collecting all four cannon components, its chances jumps to 33%. Yeah, this fucking thing rarely works. The odds are heavily stacked against you for having the cannon actually destroy the space county. I mean, it can happen. And if it does, that's a shortcut to the final stages. But when it fails, and it will fail, then you gotta go to plan B. You reinforce this old space shuttle and ram it into the space colony in hopes of it finishing the job. To do this, you simply have to go after the remaining Mavericks left on the board and then hope to God the shuttle works. Because yes, the space shuttle can also fail. And if that happens, you're getting the bad ending. Though the odds of the shuttle succeeding are much better than the cannons, why? In God's name, they think having any ounce of randomness determine the kind of ending I can get to be a good thing. Again, it's not as if the game immediately ends if both the cannon and space shuttle fail, but a major consequence of failing both is losing Zero, since he's the one who volunteers to pilot the shuttle into the colony because of the autopilot feature being busted. If you decided to play a Zero for the majority of the game, but got shit enough RNG to have the cannon and shuttle fail, you're stuck with X, who probably doesn't have any of his armor upgrades because you didn't bother with them as you stuck with Zero, and he also probably doesn't have any health upgrades either, since again, you decided to stick with Zero. Now, since you're able to save the game before either using the cannon or launching the shuttle, I think it's possible to keep resetting the game until you get the result you want, but I spent nearly 30 minutes resetting the game just to get the cannon to work and nothing happened. I gave up on it, and for the sake of getting footage for the bad ending, I spent almost as long resetting the game just to get the shuttle to fail, but that never happened. So, is the end result determined as soon as you collect the final component before you get the save prompt? I mean, I guess Zero's fucked no matter the scenario. Let me get back to the story real quick. Throughout X and Zero's mission, they're continuously dealing with the effects of the Sigma virus, how it corrupts robots and all that, but Zero begins noticing that the virus is actually making him stronger. I really like how it's implemented in gameplay too. Occasionally, you'll see these purple Sigma heads pop up representing the virus itself, and they have no sense of personal space. Like right here, I'm trying to collect the next armor upgrade and this asshole is hovering around me like a dog wanting a treat. If X absorbs too many of these, then you take constant damage for a couple of seconds. It's really an issue, but something you don't want to deal with anyway. But if Zero grabs too many virus heads, his health is completely restored and he's invincible for a small duration. Not every day where you can stare at a malevolent computer virus and say, oh, that's that good shit. But Zero's apparent immunity to the virus leaves the rest of the gang concerned. What's going on here, they wonder? Is Zero a potential threat? Well, if you're a longtime Mega Man fan, I'll think you'll like the answer. So it turns out Sigma has been in contact with a mysterious figure that knows all about Zero and how he works, but we never see the person in question. It's pretty damn obvious that it's Dr. Wily, and who knows more about Zero than the creator himself? <laughs> Okay, it's not Dr. Wily completely, it's rather his spirit, his essence. Whatever it is, Wily shares with Sigma how to awaken Zero to make him the bloodthirsty maniac he was back in his origin story in Mega Man X4. To accomplish this, Zero had to be exposed to not only the Sigma virus on Earth, but this specially created virus located in the space colony. So if the space shuttle fails, Sigma plans succeed and turn Zero to the dark side. I mean, due to the team's concerns, X and Zero end up fighting each other anyway for the sake of their well-being, but if Zero went maverick beforehand, that battle just got a whole lot harder. But whether Zero turns evil or not, the ensuing battle between the two leaves X and Zero a bit 
worse for wear, with Sigma attempting to capitalize on the result. Now, if Zero went Maverick, this is where he snaps out of it and sacrifices himself to save X, taking the full force of Sigma's blast. But then uh, we find that X is still lying on the floor unconscious, and Sigma, instead of taking advantage of the situation, decides to let X live until next time. Sigma, are you fucked in the head? He's right there, dude. Zero can't defend him anymore. What are you doing? If Zero didn't turn Maverick, then things are a bit better for a small amount of time. No matter who kills Sigma, Zero, oh my god, Zero, Jesus, it's a good thing these guys have no blood. Zero's caught in Sigma's final explosion, but the remains of Sigma still try to have the last laugh, firing one more laser that cuts through X and Zero like a shish kebab. But with his last ounce of strength, Zero takes out Sigma for good with a well-placed cannon shot. So that's how you use it, right? You just gotta be on death's fucking doorway. Sigma is wiped out, but Zero finally succumbs to his wounds. Three years pass by and X is seen still fighting the good fight, honoring his deceased friend by wielding his trusty Z-Saber. Do you remember Dynamo? The fuck happened to him? I have to say, there's certainly a sense of finality with this story. Okay, well, at least the end of Zero story, because the series is always called Mega Man X, and X is still alive by the end, so they can technically continue the story with something else, but if this were the final game in the lineup, I guess it's an okay conclusion. We finally get that X and Zero confrontation that X3 spoiled for us some time ago, but at the end of the day, it's still Sigma that's the ultimate bad guy. It's interesting that Dr. Wily was involved in some capacity to give us another bridge between the classic and X series, but this is really the only time it matters because after this, Wily's influence and all that is gone with the wind, never to be mentioned again as far as I'm aware. Also, Zero's death is treated as a big deal, and I get why this is supposed to be the last game and such, but did they forget this wasn't the first time he's been through this situation? He was fucking blown in half when he sacrificed himself near the end of X1, and a big point of X2 is putting him back together, so unless something's changed, couldn't they just do that again? And on that note, and I really should have brought this up in X4, but if Zero loved Iris so much, why not just fix her back up? She's a robot. Robots can be rebuilt. Am I an asshole for thinking this? Yeah, most likely. It's just when they established that Zero could survive something like this before with how many times Sigma has come back from the brink, uh, death sort of loses its impact. Or it could be missing the point entirely. As the supposed end to the X lineup, X5 is chock full of callbacks to both the X series and the original series. Remixed music from past games, returning obstacles like Quick Man's death lasers, the disappearing, reappearing blocks, and let's not forget the fucking Shadow Devil! Yeah, this is something we needed to call back to, and fuck me, this guy does so much damage on contact! Look, look how much he took away from me, what the fuck? Thankfully though, I can cheese this fucker by constantly wall jumping, completing avoiding his stupid block attacks, but damn is it murder on my thumbs. But you know what, these references to past games and such really give Mega Man X uh, a celebratory feel. One final hurrah before it's put to rest to focus on another series. I don't like how the ending is ultimately determined by RNG no matter how well you can stack the odds in your favor and even safe scum doesn't seem to work most of the time, and some stages are just mindless slogs, especially when trying to nab all the upgrades. It goes backwards with a couple of things, like how it handles armor upgrades and all that, but it does enough right to make it a solid, if somewhat mundane adventure. Mega Man X5 is not the best place to start, but it's not the worst of the bunch either. If it had to be the last game, I'd say it ended on a positive note. But alas, this wasn't the last game in the series. One more was made for the PlayStation 1, a decision entirely made by Capcom against Keiji Inafune's wishes, like he had nothing to do with this one, period. One year after the release of Mega Man X5, Mega Man X6 was put on store shelves. A quick thing before we start. Now Mega Man X6 has enough going against it already, but one thing people bring up all the time is its release window. Now it's true that Mega Man X6 was released a mere 9 months after Mega Man X5 in America, but in Japan it was almost a full year since Mega Man X5, and yeah, a year's time isn't a whole lot in terms of development, there are certain risks, but it shouldn't be an immediate condemnation, and let's not pretend this is the first time the X series has done something like this. Like I said, X2 was released just a year after X1, and X3 was released a year after X2, and bearing my personal opinions on X3, those are considered good games. X4 gets some leeway being released a year and a half after X3, well actually since the original development team didn't work on X3, I guess it's technically been two and a half years since X2. My point is yes, a year between releases is usually not a good sign, but it isn't something exclusive to X6. It can be done right, and it has been done right before. Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Crash Bandicoot 2, Mega Man X2, that's all I'm trying to get at here. And trust me, Mega Man X6 has got it rough enough as is. So this is it, right? It's not exactly a secret that Mega Man X6 is often considered the bottom of the barrel in both the X franchise and Mega Man in its entirety. For a time, this game is a shock to me because I actually played this game a number of times back in the early 2000s and remembered liking it. I rented it a handful of times from Hollywood Video and Blockbuster. It was during my jump back into the X series now that I had my own PlayStation 2. Yeah, I went from Mega Man X1 and then X2, and then I jumped to X6 and then worked my way backwards. I'm a bit of an oddball. 
I remembered liking the graphics, then again, I was easily impressionable back in the day, and I especially remember enjoying the soundtrack. In fact, let's get that out of the way now, no matter what I end up saying at the end of this video. Mega Man X6's soundtrack is easily my favorite of the PS1 trilogy. There's a lot about it I absolutely love. It knows how to rock out, it knows how to be somber, it's got good techno, the instrumental quality is just a caliber above the rest in my opinion. I know I didn't spend any time discussing the music in X4, X5, and it's not because I think they're bad. There's a couple of tracks I enjoyed in those games, the boss tracks specifically, but the amount of songs I enjoy is nowhere near how much I enjoy in Mega Man X6. I wouldn't technically own Mega Man X6 until I bought the X collection some odd years back, and most of my time on that bundle was spent on X1, X2, and X4. It wouldn't be until my commentary on Brain Scratch comms that I gave the game a proper revisit, and let's just say there was a lot I didn't remember about my teenage years. I guess I blacked out the bad stuff. Well, let's start from the top. X6 already begins with some confusion. Instead of three years passing since X5, it's only been three weeks since the Space Colony incident and when Zero sacrificed himself to save X and destroy the remains of Sigma. But uh, according to the beginning of X6, the Space Colony ended up crashing into the Earth and nearly wiped the planet out, an event that only happens if the Space Shuttle plan fails, which results in Zero turning Maverick. In that scenario, Zero ends up dead before the final battle with Sigma, meaning he isn't there to deliver the coup de grace to Sigma's head to save X, and on top of that, the ending concludes with X's memory of Zero being completely wiped out by Dr. Light. Why not just have the game take place after the good ending, where only a small fraction of the space station still landed on Earth? It could have worked out given the plot of this game. Why immediately start retconning shit and create this confusing third timeline? Okay, so our story begins with a reploid scientist named Gate inspecting the catastrophic wreckage of the space colony. Upon discovering some mysterious remains on the ground, the man slowly begins losing his mind and starts unleashing his grand experiment upon the world, the Nightmare, a virus that can... Honestly, do whatever the fuck it wants. It can cause robots to hallucinate, it can drive them crazy and turn them maverick, it can it can turn lava purple, turn the lights off. Seriously, whatever strange occurrence that happens in X6 is literally blamed on the nightmare every single time. It's this game's excuse for all the irritating shit you're bound to run into. With the nightmare at his disposal and the earth in phenomenally bad shape, Gate intends to create a world solely for perfect and the strongest reploids, and he's not only willing to wipe out humans, but low-class reploids as well. Elsewhere, X and his Sunshine gang are curious to the origin of the nightmare, and think that this man named Isaac and his investigation team are suspicious, feeling that they have ulterior motives and are secretly instigating the nightmare phenomena. Their suspicions are eventually proven right, and soon they learn that Isaac and his crew are working for Gate. For Aelia, this is a bit heart-wrenching, as she and Gate were former colleagues, something I thought the game would do more with with, but it ultimately doesn't mean a goddamn thing because at the end of the day, it's X that does all the work. Maybe if this was a solo Aelia adventure where she has to deal with all this shit herself. I mean, X is actually pretty good about giving Aelia more backstory. She's easily the most fleshed out character among the support group. Cygnus and Douglas are back, it's just, they're just sort of there. X6 reveals that she's got a bit of a dark past and that gate going nuts is kind of forcing her to deal with that internally. It never leads to anything and that way it fails, but the attempt is clear cut and had X6 had more time to stew, I'm sure Aelia would have been more directly involved. But Gate is eventually discovered as the head honcho and X raids his home base to deal with the matter personally. Gate and his glamorous Sentai gear is sooner or later put down and the day seems safe, but because we can't dare have an original villain in an X game, Gate reveals that he managed to resurrect Sigma as a backup plan. I'm fucking serious, Sigma is just suddenly brought into the plot just like that, and while I do like the fact that he's sort of a pathetic zombie now, you know, seeing that he was brought back in such a hurry and at least to like a, a creepy encounter, this is such a weak ass conclusion. Sigma is taking care of Lickety Split because no shit his boss battle is one of the easiest if not THE easiest in the franchise. And the day is finally z Oh right, Zero is in this game! Yeah, so one of the first nightmare effects that X encounters at the start of the game is a hallucination of Zero. At first it seems helpful, seeing as it helps X take care of this large robot that was causing trouble earlier, but the next time X runs into it, should he run into it, the thing is suddenly hostile and X takes him out, but immediately after the nightmare Zero dies, the real Zero suddenly shows up. It just happens! No fanfare, no dramatic reveal, Zero just pops up like an office co-worker late for work. Turns out Zero didn't die from Sigma's attack at the end of X5 after all, and by that I mean the good ending of X5. In the aftermath, Zero apparently went into seclusion and repaired himself, or to quote him directly, he hid himself and then repaired himself. Wow! Wow! Seriously? That's what they're going with? Look at him at the end of X5! Look at him! He is nothing but a torso and an arm! Now, it is strongly implied that Dr. Light actually has something to do with Zero's resurrection, but they never outright say it, and I don't know why they play that up as a mystery, because there's no way in hell I would ever believe that Zero brought himself back from the brink. For the record, I'm not against him coming back, period. He's done so before, but in X2 he had to be put back together like a Lego set thanks to the combined efforts of X and Dr. King. So just say Dr. Light brought him back and leave it at that. None of this hid myself, repair myself bullshit. What the fuck did that look like? But yeah, Zero's back and he agrees to help X in his mission to stop the nightmare. From then on, the plot continues as normal. Now, if you finish the game as Zero, we get something a little extra. Fearing that his presence is a danger to society for the time being, Zero agrees to put himself in a deep sleep until the remains of whatever malevolent virus residing within him is completely eradicated. According to Zero's physician, because I think that's who he's supposed to be, this process will take over a hundred years 
and Zero is perfectly willing to accept those conditions. He heads into the deep sleep and believes that X is more than capable of handling things for himself from now on. Now this is clearly the setup for the eventual Mega Man Zero series on the Game Boy Advance, but seeing as there's still two Mega Man X games after this that spoiler warning have Zero up and about, this ending seems a little strange, but the time frame of this ending is never explicitly stated, so this could technically be at the end of X8 or some other game, we never know. Either way, I don't think X6's story is awful, but it's tremendously undercooked. Making the villain someone close to X's teammates was a good idea to add some emotional depth to the plot in a way that I thought that could have been better than what they try to do with Zero, Iris, and the Colonel. Gate wasn't always a bad guy, but his ideals made him rather unpopular, and some devious dickheads behind the scenes really made his life a living hell. After discovering that hidden debris at the beginning of the story, which the game later reveals as remnants of Zero's DNA, the man is corrupted by the virus most likely left over from Mega Man X5, and because of that, he totally loses it, and attempts to enact revenge on those who wronged him. It's a little tragic, and something I think would have meant more if Alia was more involved in the plot. X6, among all the other games, also tries to give more depth to the Mavericks you face off. I mean, some are just one note jerk offs, but a couple are given pretty tragic backstories that don't necessarily make them Mavericks, but since they're willing to defend Gate by any means necessary, they're unfortunately in our way and have to be put down. Some even respect X and Zero a great deal and regret the circumstances of their meeting, but again, it's all undercooked because when push comes to shove, it's still a typical Mega Man X game, and it's not as if you can convince any of these guys to lay their arms down. Lord knows X will want nothing more than to not fight. You also don't learn about most of these details until Alia tells you about them after you already killed them, making the whole thing feel rushed. It most likely was, but the idea of having having a morally great story with characters that aren't a collective bunch of dumbasses like the Repliforce is intriguing. There's no animated cutscenes, but the presentation isn't so bad, it's like a moving comic book. There's plenty of dynamic shots with different illustrations, and in the original PS1 release and on the Legacy Collection, there's voice acting. It's in Japanese, yeah, but it's better than what X5 did, where cutscenes were not only more stilted in my opinion, but every character's dialogue had this annoying ping that accompanied every individual character text. Yeah, that got ear grating in no time, so props to X6 for going the extra mile and just giving us voices even if there wasn't any time for an English dub. Or a proper localization. <laughs> I'll defend X6 and how it presents the story, but the dialogue itself reads as if it was directly translated from the Japanese script. It's like they use Google Translate. It can read so awkwardly when said out loud. It's full of redundancies, bad grammar, typos galore. It's not a pretty sight. One of the biggest consequences of the crunch development, no doubt. But man, this is just the tip of the iceberg. X6 is defined gimmick is the nightmare system. In a way, it's like the stage alternation gimmick of X1, cranked up to 11 with little explanation for how it fully works. Alia informs you that stages highlighted in red are currently under the effect of the nightmare. Now this seems random, and honestly, it might as well be given how unclear it is for the first time player, but certain stages are only capable of having a couple of obstacles. Rainy Turtleoid, for instance, can either have these images of X and Zero pop up and ram into you, or your visibility becomes absolute shit and it's next to impossible to see what's ahead of you. And this is on top of the stage's inherent gimmick of acid rain repeatedly draining your health. What the game doesn't make clear is that the nightmare effects can happen anyway if you happen to defeat the correlating boss before so. If you defeat it Metal Shark player, then Blaze Heatnix will have these metal blocks all over the place that impede your progress. Defeat Blaze Heatnix, and Blizzard Wolfang will get these fireballs that make the stage incredibly fucking irritating. Defeating certain Mavericks only affects certain stages, but it does not matter if a stage is highlighted in red, and that's the annoying part because the game makes you think otherwise, it lies to you. So you can imagine the confusion you might feel when you try to avoid the red stages at the moment only to run into another nightmare effect from a stage that wasn't highlighted. And man, certain nightmare effects in some of these stages make for some of the most aggravating level design in Mega Man X, period. The darkness effect in Rainy Turloid makes progression a goddamn chore, even more so in Commander Yanmark's stage, where you also have to deal with instant kill spikes, something I swear Mega Man X6 has a fetish for. It's worse than Mega Man 4. But Blaze Heat Nick's fireballs and Blizzard Wolfang's level? Holy fuck, how are you supposed to avoid getting hit? I mean, without wasting a thousand hours of your life, Life into the game. Without knowing how to manipulate it in some capacity, the nightmare effect exemplifies frustrating mechanics inside an already clumsy game because, oh yes, even without the nightmare effect, X6's level design is just a major step backwards and the definition of irritating. I hope you're not epileptic given how much you're gonna see X and Zero flash white all the goddamn time with how often you're gonna get hit. I mean, Fuck guys, what happened here? Enemies are incessantly spammed harder here than in Mega Man X3, even those that are chunky motherfuckers that don't go down with an easily well-charged shot or saber slash. And if it isn't shit like that, it's just the stage gimmick entirely. Blaze Heatnik's idea of a level is taking this mini boss right here and just having you fight the thing five fucking times. And without the proper special weapon, especially as X, it's a fucking nightmare, pardon the pun. 
I recommend doing Metal Shark Player as X beforehand or Infinity Maginion as Zero to get these screen nukes, but Metal Shark Player stage has its own problems. Oh my, this is a painful ass slog. And Infinity Maginion stage isn't too bad, but the boss fight feels so random in execution, even more so with X. It feels there are more instant kill obstacles in this game than all the other previous games combined, whether it's the higher than average bottomless pit count, the purple lava and blaze heat nicks, or the severely damaging fire spots. Fuck me, this hurt is zero. The spikes in Commander Yanmark stage on top of the obscuring camera angles, the trash compactor and Metal Shark Player, it never ends. And if you lack hindsight, or shit, sometimes it depends on the game, you can find yourself in impossible to win scenarios. So in this game, there are alternate pathways you can take when you find these blue portals. Most of the time, they're filled with extra items like heart tanks, sub tanks, or more hostages to rescue. These pathways also have their own boss fights. At first, it's Nightmare Zero, and he's relatively easy to take down as long as you use X's Z Saber, but when Nightmare Zero is finished, the boss of these alternate pathways becomes High Max, one of Gate's creations. Do not fight this guy as soon as possible. Do not take another alternate pathway until you defeat at least one match. High max is impossible to damage with your default weapon. Impossible. Your charge shot, your Z Saber, nada, nothing happens. So what can you do? Nothing, absolutely nothing. It's a dead game until you lose all your lives and leave the stage. That's absurd. No other X game before put you in that kind of scenario. You could damage the X Hunters with your regular weapon. You could damage Bit and Bite with your regular weapons, but high max, it's like a punishment for basic exploration. I mean, shit. In some unfortunate circumstances, the level can be impossible to complete through no fault of your own. Just for the love of God, do not pick Normal X. This game was clearly not playtested with him. Sometimes the air dash, which Normal X does not have, is required to just progress. And if you were unfortunate enough to enter, say, the alternate pathway in Commander Yanmark stage, guess what? You can't cross this overly large pit. That's a game over. And in Ground Scaravich, this can happen on a complete whim. A big thing about his stage is that a level layout is chosen at complete random when you enter these virtual totem poles. And one of those layouts has an overly large pit that normal X cannot cross. No, just no, that's broken design. No matter who you choose, it should be possible to just complete a stage, no matter the circumstance. You don't leave something like that up to chance. And if upgrades should be needed for anything, it should be for optional shit. By default, X has his Falcon armor from X5, although the invincible flight feature was removed seeing as the armor was damaged between games. The charge shot is this pathetic pea shooter that can still hurt, but not any better than normal aim. The armor still gives you added defenses, has an air dash, and comes with a screen nuke that I can't for the life of me used properly. It's no Giga Crush from X2, not by a mile. But for all intents and purposes, this should be your default armor until you grab the other upgrades, even if the charge shot isn't that good. X's new Z Saber isn't bad as a close range option, it's good to have all bases covered specifically for X in this game, but he doesn't wield it with the same proficiency as Zero. He has no combo game, he just does one large swing, and it isn't terribly fast. Good for damage, but a little unreliable. And unfortunately, X6 continues X5's stupid design choice of needing all four armor upgrades collected before you're able to use them. And unlike X5, there's no logical in-story reason for this. Light just says for security reasons. The blade armor isn't too shabby, all things considered. The charge shot is good, you can charge special weapons with it, your Z Saber gets some added power, and you're capable of doing a quick four-directional dash like in Mega Man X3, making progression a little easier for X. I want to love the shadow armor. Who doesn't like the idea of a robot ninja? You shoot ninja stars, you can cling on ceilings, you're immune to spikes, you can't use special weapons, but your Z Saber is now orange flavor. The shadow armor doesn't have an air dash though, and that alone cripples it in my opinion, causing it to fall under the same trappings as normal X if you don't have the necessary parts equipped. Okay, to get a little more positive here, this is something I think X6 does better than X5, the return of the parts system. So in X5, every once in a while, you can find Reploids in need of health. They were basically health pickups that also gave you extra lives in a game where lives didn't matter anyway. There are a ton more of these guys in X6. And they mostly serve the same purpose, but now select hostages also contain parts that you can equip to X and Zero for added perks. For X, these are damn essential, especially if you don't bother getting the armor upgrades, not just because of the no win scenarios I mentioned earlier, but also because the first stage of Gates Fortress is literally impossible with X. You'll need the jumper part from this hostage in Blizzard Wolfang to leap over these spikes, which holy fuck Gates Fortress is overloaded with. But there's the hyper dash for longer dashing, the speedster to make your default movement faster, a free health restore that you can have on top of your sub tanks, a part that doubles your invincibility frames. God, this one is a fucking lifesaver for either character. There's several things you can get for X and Zero, and it helps to explore and find as many hostages as possible. Just not as soon as possible because you don't want to run into that no win scenario with high max that I mentioned earlier. But to begin equipping these parts, your hunter rank needs to be at a proper level firstly, and in X6, you now increase this by collecting nightmare souls. Whenever you find these noodle guys, you can collect the souls they drop when they die. Under the right conditions, you can get a shitload of them by running into Dynamo because fuck it, he's not doing anything at the moment. What an utterly pointless character this guy is. Collect enough souls, your rank increases, and you can finally start equipping multiple parts, and they aren't limited by certain armors either anymore. Just don't leave these souls idle for too long because the soul amount quickly diminishes if that happens, eventually causing the nightmare to respawn, and if you kill it again afterwards, it won't drop a single soul, period. Another thing to watch out for is nightmares that are close to hostages. If this happens, you kill that motherfucker immediately because nightmares will slowly head towards whatever hostage is close by and attempt to permanently corrupt them, and when that 
that happens, that hostage is considered dead. And if that hostage had a useful part for X and Zero, that son of a bitch is gone for good unless you reload your save file. Yeah, you just can't exit and re-enter the stage because hostages don't respawn. <sighs> With the right set of parts alongside armor upgrades, knowledge of how the nightmare system works, and let's face it, a high tolerance to pain, the game becomes somewhat bearable. And you know what? Mega Man X6 is one of those games I find some enjoyment from when I attempt to speedrun it, specifically a zero. He's got the double jump by default now, making progression much smoother to handle compared to X. His Z Saber can eat through a lot of enemies at once. His Z Buster has been massively improved since X5. Seriously, it does an obnoxious amount of damage when you shoot at point blank range, it's like a shotgun. There's even a couple of glitches I can do with the right tools, like using Rainy Turtle Oil's technique on this guy to get infinite invincibility frames. Now look at me as I run through everything without taking damage, and I can also do this in Gates Fortress as well, thank fuck. For some reason I can use Shield Sheldon's Guard Shield to cause Zero Saber to fucking annihilate some Mavericks, I don't even need it for Rainy Turtle Oid, I can just stand behind him and do this, because that's a thing you can do in this game for some baffling reason. Kinda like Sonic 06, there's something I find fun in breaking this game. That ain't an accolade for the record, that's just me being a stubborn dumbass. I can't do nearly as much as X. The best I can get is using Commander Yanmark's weapon to blast through a lot at once. This is actually a pretty good weapon, but that's fucking it. I'm dead serious. I do not see the utility for the other weapons at all, if there's any to be had. I can use the Ice Block to get this one hostage. That's... All right, the charged metal anchor could potentially be good, but you're not invincible while using it, so if you get hit, the entire attack gets canceled and it fucking sucks. For maximum comfortability, I highly, highly recommend using the cheat code for X's ultimate armor or Zero's black armor. Zero is such a glass cannon in this game normally, and without the shock buffer part, the one that increases your defense that one of these hostages give you, I don't remember which fucking one does it, without that, Zero dies so easily. With the black armor though, you have the shock buffer on by default, as well as a stronger Z saber, so you can deal more damage. I used to play Mega Man X6 with ultimate armor, and Black Zero all the time, which is probably why I thought it wasn't so bad back in the day, but bottom line, if I have to use a cheat code to make the game more tolerable for me on a level that is still nowhere near close to the quality of X1, X2, or X4, that is a major problem, a big fucking problem. There are workarounds. In fact, another thing you can do now if you have the Legacy Collection is play with the Rookie Hunter mode turned on. For X6, the added damage reduction and slight changes to the level design makes the game a bit better, so you can totally play it that way if you want to, but it doesn't change the fact that Mega Man X6 fundamentally is a giant mess. No matter how you approach it, the level design is some of the worst in the franchise. It's got some of the most dickheaded boss fights on top of that. The Nightmare Mother High Max Round 2 is X. Gay can rot in Android hell, fuck what Alia thinks. The production values aren't bad as far as graphics and music go, but the rush translation makes dialogue hella awkward to read at multiple points. I mean, I don't personally play these games for story, but that's not something I can just ignore out of preference. No way in hell I can recommend this as either a good Mega Man X game or a video game, period, when the number of better options out there far outweigh what joy you can possibly find in this one. I guess it wouldn't hurt to try it on Legacy Collection with Rookie Hunter mode turned on. I don't think anybody will hold it against you, and if they did, fuck them. This is something I think only diehards can find some semblance of joy from. I can find little nuggets here and there, but only when I'm breaking the rules. This game cheats, so I cheat back. Fuck it. I need to step away for a bit. I can see Mega Man X7 over the horizon, but I want to make a quick diversion to hopefully a much simpler time. Next up, I'm going to take a look at Mega Man Extreme 1 and Mega Man Extreme 2 for the Game Boy. With all that said, thank you all for watching. Have yourselves a fantastic night. And take care. Whew. God damn, this is a long one. What the fuck? Where was this asshole at? Barges into my Mega Man 3 video, but suddenly too good for my Mega Man X6 video? Tonsillitis wasn't that convenient. Well, I got something for his ass later on. Oh shit, the camera's still on.